Yes. Yes. OK. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, attending the meeting. I'll be the session's moderator, so um, I'll start by presenting myself. My name is Rabib Jad, and um, I'm a product a production support analyst. Um, I'm in a mission uh, in Société Générale, the investment bank. Uh, for today, we'll be having a very interesting session with uh, Dr. Annie Summit. So uh, he is a PhD holder from uh, HEC Montreal, Canada, and he is um, a certified in financial risk manager. So before jo joining the, um, the uh, American University of Sherka, uh, Dr. Anis taught in, at Abu Dhabi University and worked as a risk management advisor with one of the largest institutional investors in Canada and has published in leading financial journals such as the Journal of the Banking and Finance. His research interests include international finance, corporate finance, corporate governance, financial risk management, financial markets, Islamic finance, and financial econometrics. And today he will be presenting, um, as we said, a very interesting and important subject, uh, the startup toolkit, the way to make your fintech successful. So as I said in the beginning of the session, uh, feel free to ping us all of your questions and we will be discussing them at the end of the session. So I give you the floor, uh, Dr. Salman. Thank you so much, uh, Rabab, uh, for the introduction. Uh, dear attendees, thank you for attending this session. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, Sammy for coming up with this great idea to organize this event. It's it's the first one uh, for sure, but it would follow up with uh, more uh, events where we can discuss like issues that where how can we improve the uh, ecosystem in Tunisia to make Tunisia probably uh, uh, more fintech friendly, more startup friendly, and then uh, to attract probably more ideas and how to finance these ideas in Tunisia. So uh, again, it's a, it's a great opportunity for all of us to see where do we stand right now, what we can improve and how can we improve that? And uh, for sure, how can we move forward? And this is the only way to, uh, to make our economy growing by creating these startups and specifically uh, what I will talk about here, the FinTech. Uh, I was expecting probably a little bit uh, different audience, uh, probably some young uh, uh, young generations or the, the generations who are graduating soon or who are thinking about ideas. But uh, anyway, so hopefully uh, this session will be recorded and then they can probably benefit from it later on after sharing the content of the session. So agenda of the meeting, so introduction, steps for startup founders, financing startups, fintech industry, fintech segments um, where uh, uh, FinTech can operate startups, uh, Startup Act in Tunisia, Startup in Tunisia, uh, uh, how are they exactly, what kind of startup do we have right now, and finally, challenges and opportunities for startups in Tunisia. Uh, just to add one more thing, so I, I act, I'm a professor of finance, but I also act as a mentor in a uh, incubator and accelerator here in the UAE, in Sharjah specifically, for, and specifically for FinTech. There are few FinTechs uh, launched recently, and then I'll, I might talk about the, uh, the 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 work they have done, what they are doing, uh, and then how did they conduct their uh, business now, and where do they stand right now uh, specifically. So, uh, introduction: We all know that innovation is the main driving force behind economic development and the increase of uh, productivity in a knowledge-based society. That's according to the World Bank. Um, uh, countries that are innovate more, are innovating more, definitely they have better or higher growth, economic growth, and then they uh, they have lower unemployment, they create more wealth in their economies. In the long run, startup companies create a large portion of new jobs and contribute to the country's economic growth. These startups, these are or startup entrepreneurs or founders, these are the doers um, in the future. So if you have uh, several startups that will see the light, that will be successful, obviously this will help in terms of economic growth, they will create wealth in the economy without any doubt. Innovation and entrepreneurship are recognized as the key building blocks of competitive and dynamic economies. Just like again, according to the World Bank, the global financial crisis required developing economies to actively seek new source of economic growth 
not only the, the financial crisis, but now the recent pandemic as well has forced a lot of economies to move toward more digital economies, to start to have more startup, to, to solve issues, to come up with solutions for several now issues that uh, 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 the economies were facing. Uh, the digital economy can be significant to the GDP, and we'll see some numbers later on. So these, uh, uh, these digital economy can play an extremely important role in terms of creating economic growth and also help uh, uh, lowering the unemployment and creating uh, wealth within the economy. Okay. Uh, the global startup economy uh, is very large, so creating nearly three trillion uh, in value, um, uh, which is similar to any GDP of a G7 economy. So the global startup economy is growing and uh, we can see that the growth is quite high. We talk about 20% growth per year uh, over the last, let's say, two years, which is huge, by the way. I mean, if you compare that, the uh, the growth of startup economy as compared to any uh, industry in the economy, so you cannot like find any industry that can grow at that uh, huge pace or high pace uh, in any of the economy worldwide. So it's these startup they are contributing to the economy, they are growing extremely fast all over the world. Now, um, what I put here, I put, I, I, as, I, as I said at the beginning, I thought that some people would be interested to see what should I think about before I even start thinking about my startup. So there are a few steps here that were uh, confirmed by the Forbes uh, again, and these are uh, uh, some steps that any uh, startup founder should think about before starting his or her startup. First of all, understand the commitment and challenges involved in starting a business. Obviously, uh, uh, before starting a business, you have to, or any startup founder, should make sure that he or she has enough capital and cash flow to uh, to manage the business at, at, at least at the beginning, before seeking any fundraising afterwards. Working more than you expected, because it's, it's a startup, it will take a lot of work, a lot of work that uh, uh, requires also managing the time efficiently in a very efficient way. And that's what we, we, we always recommend the, uh, the startup founders from the beginning. Uh, maintain a reasonable work and life balance. Why exactly? Because many uh, startup founders, they work hard at the beginning, they, and they reach a level where they have like burnout, so they, and they can no longer uh, make any progress. So, Anyone who is working on his or her startup should have that kind of balance to make sure that it will be sustainable. They can, they can, they can continue working on their idea to make their idea successful for sure. And then um, the last point, it's, it, it talks about don't give up. Always keep working, keep improving, keep, uh, keep, keep progressing and never give up your idea. And you can, for sure, you can adjust your strategy, but never give up the uh, initial idea. Now, step number two, protect your personal asset by forming the business as a corporation or LLC. Again, so uh, the founders, they have to think about separating their personal assets to the, from the company's assets. And the best way is to form a company that where the, uh, uh, the, the company has its own assets that are completely different from the assets of the entrepreneur, of the uh, startup founder. Uh, came up with a great name for your business. This is the first thing that can attract uh, either customers or fundraisers. So the name is extremely important uh, to the, for that startup, for this new business that could attract uh, several uh, participants in that business. So make sure that the name is not hard to spell, for instance, is not hard to memorize. The logo as well would be extremely important that way. Okay. Again, I will go quickly over these steps. So focus on building great product, but don't take forever to launch. So obviously everyone who is working on an idea would like to come up with the best ever product. I have a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, friends in Canada. These are, these are IT engineers. They start working on ideas and they, they work years to come up with something which is full. It, it tackles all the issues. And you know what? After a few years, they give up because they have never talked to anyone else. They have never talked to their customers, potential customers. They have never talked to a friend about the idea to see what's missing. Is that enough to start at least launching or talking about the idea to some other people to seek their feedback, to see whether it's interesting or not, to see whether it solves an issue or not. So they, they lock themselves into a room, work hard, and then probably halfway 
they will give up because they have never shared that with other people. So in other words, uh, this is what it means here. So don't take forever to launch a product as long as you find out that it's interesting, it solves an issue, it has a value and added value, you have to start uh, at least like uh, selling that product. I mean, when I say selling, selling the idea, not necessarily the product, but selling the idea and find out whether there are people who uh, will be liking the idea, liking the product once it's ready, and this will help a lot in terms of gaining a lot of time and don't give up halfway. Uh, uh, so uh, now the next one is build a great website for a company. Any startup should first about think about having a great website, easy to use, and then uh, this give this uh, actually recently I had the example of Tunisian sweet makers. A lot of ladies in Tunisia they they make some sweets, and you know what? They don't have any commercial or physical uh, commercial uh, 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 representation. But what they do, they have nice website. They they people they can order through their websites. They deliver at home, and then there is no need to have to, or to have literally a physical facility or commercial facility where they can sell their products. This will save them a lot of time. But again, this is what I mean here. So you have to have a great digital presence on uh, on the web and then make sure that your website is well designed, well uh, prepared for it. Okay. Uh, perfect your elevator pitch. Usually you have to make sure that you have a short, concise presentation of your idea. Uh, as 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 a startup founder, you need to present that to probably potential investors, to to customers, to regulators. If you would like to challenge some of the regulations that are in place, which happened several times in Tunisia by fintech that were presenting to the central bank, what are the challenges? And then, I mean, if you have nice talk, nice presentation, the idea which is well structured, you can. Uh, convince the uh, uh, audience easily and then you can sell your idea in a much easier way. Uh, make the deal clear with your co-founder. This is what you, everyone who would like to uh, start a new business or startup founders should think about uh, to avoid any conflict later on, legal litigation conflict or risk later on. And this, this by the way, it happened in several uh, big names now, such as Facebook and so on, where the co-founders at the beginning, they did not have a clear uh, a clear uh, a deal from the beginning, so that was leading to some uh, litigation risk or uh, uh, legal risks later on. So uh, how is the equity split among the co-founders from the beginning should be discussed and put uh, black on white. What's the percentage of ownership subject to vesting ba based on continued participation in the business or not? So some people, they will be continuing working on the business and some others will not, will stop. What are the roles and responsibilities of the founders and so on? Now, if the if one of the founders that like leave, what's the exit plan? At which price? Um, and so on. So everything should be discussed and written uh, in a legal document that that protects the uh, uh, every each one of the co-founders. When you hire any employee in the uh, startup, so uh, the startup founder should take the time to check so uh, uh, on the profile of the employee. Why? Because if you hire uh, good talent, great talent, who have the motivation, um, uh, who are interested in the business, who uh, might have some incentives to make the business successful, then this will help a lot in making that startup a successful business. Uh, can say that the steps that you should prote take to protect the, uh, the IP, intellectual property. So again, uh, because a lot of startups, they are based on ideas. And then if the idea is not registered. If you don't have the IP, if you don't have the patent or trademark, anyone else can take the idea and then develop the same kind of solution. Then you are dead. I mean, you cannot then claim any uh, anything later on. So first of all, uh, specifically, if there is a new idea, new uh, new way of solving things, you uh, uh, the startup founder they should uh, uh, think about the IP. They have to guarantee that uh, they are protected by either the patents or trademark um, uh, and so on. Uh, then understand financial statements and budget. You can have great technical skills, but as long as you don't understand the financial statements, budget, cash flows, and so on, this will not make the business successful, obviously. Uh, then every entrepreneur should have some basic knowledge about uh, what's the company three-year projection at least? Uh, what are the key assumptions underlying these projections? Do they make sense or not? Um, uh, uh, how much equity and debt should the company rely on in the mix of capital structure? What's future equity or debt financing will be necessary? 
Um, and then one important, extremely important question, when will the company get to profitability? And then this is very important because the company can only survive if you know when the company will turn into a profitable business. And then at that time, then you can uh, start paying back your debt, uh, uh, growing and so on. Last but not least, have a great investor pitch deck and market your business like crazy. So don't never give up. This is what it, it says literally here, because you might have the ups and downs. And I mean, like any any uh, any uh, 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 new business or new ideas. So you might have the ups and downs when when you feel down. So as an entrepreneur or a startup founder, never give up. And then you should always keep talking about your business. Keep trying to sell. Adjust your strategy. Adjust. Uh, uh, adjust all the factors but that makes your business successful but still i mean try to to sell uh, as much as you can your business to uh, to create some noise to attract uh, uh, fund uh, fund providers to attract customers or potential customers okay uh, finally secure capital to finance your business obviously the way that you secure that either through personal funds or friends and family or we talk about angel invest investors probably some people they don't necessarily know what's the uh, the rationale behind behind uh, angel, angel investors these investors actually we call them angel and then the first angel investors they used to finance theater artwork and these were like uh, people who love theater and then because some of the artwork are not financed by governments or the cultural or ministry of culture and so on so these people were literally uh, uh, volunteering to finance these artwork and these they have no uh, not only they, they don't necessarily have only the aim of making money, but because they love that industry, they love that uh, that business. Uh, and then this is what uh, should any angel investor have here at the end of the day. So the aim is not necessarily only to make money, but because probably people they worked in the same industry before, people they would love to to help the young generations in terms of uh, uh, making the these their ideas successful. So these are what we call angel investors. Then we have now nowadays talk about crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. So uh, it was presented several times today and yesterday in the presentation. So the crowdfunding now is uh, recently has been recently the new tool of raising these funds uh, through the crowdfunding platforms. Um, and then we have the VC venture capitalists or venture capital. So these are uh, funds that are that will be uh, 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 financing these new project startups uh, in the aim of making money, obviously, at the end of the day. Now, uh, there is one big difference between crowdfunding and VCs. And then uh, the, the, main, the main difference uh, is that the crowdfunding, the, it's just a platform that will be uh, putting uh, fund uh, providers with fund uh, needers at the same time, same place, but they do not necessarily, they do not provide any, um, any help, any assistance, any, any, assistance, any, uh, any mentorship while the VC actually not only they provide these funds, but they actually offer some assistance, some uh, mentorship, some help in, in terms of pro, uh, on, in terms of finding potential customers, employees, partners and so on. So this is the main difference in crowdfunding and VCs. And then there are actually research that looks at uh, uh, how successful are uh, startups that are financed by crowdfunding as compared to uh, uh, startups that are financed by VCs, and then uh, they try to find out which one is more successful. Uh, and then, obviously, because the two ways of funding is completely different uh, uh, by providing more uh, uh, mentorship, more help, more assistance through the VC as compared to typical crowd crowdfunding platforms. Also, something that uh, uh, any start startup founder should be aware of: uh, these are startup incubators and accelerators. These are completely different. Uh, now, for early, early stage startups, so uh, incubators they help you in terms of uh, finding the idea, uh, polishing uh, polishing your presentations, pitching that. But also uh, after that, you can go and um, uh, deal with accelerators who will help you in terms of. Uh, 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 making the business more successful uh, 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 in the in the in the short run. Now, what are incubators or what incubators can do? So, begin with companies that may be at earlier uh, uh, stage. So, in the process, and do not uh, operate as uh, on a set of schedule. In other words, when you go and uh, talk to incubators, they do not have like timeline as compared to accelerators where you have the timeline. So, incubators you can stay with the incubators for a few months, 
sometimes more than a year. In my case, uh, when, while monitoring some of the companies here in, in the UAE, uh, these startups, they stay more than a year with the incubator uh, because of the probably they, they did not did not find enough time, they did not find enough resources at the beginning to finance their activity. So it, it takes time at the beginning. There is no timeline for, uh, for the incubators, okay? Um, now, within the incubator company, we refine its idea, build out its business plan, work on product market fit, identify intellectual property if there is any IP issues, and network in the startup ecosystem, understand how things work, and so on. So this is typical, uh, typically what incubators can do now when it comes to accelerators. So accelerators program usually have a set of time frames. In other words, you have a timeline that you have to follow. It could be within a few weeks or a few months but it will not take that long time as compared to what incubators can have. Okay, so uh, accelerators start with an application process, but the top programs are typically very selective. So in other words, if you uh, target any accelerators, uh, if they are very, if they are uh, well known, so they would be very selective in terms of what, uh, what uh, startups they accept and what, which ones do they, don't they accept. And then we talk about the best in accelerators, I mean, uh, worldwide, they accept sometimes two or three percent of all the applications that they receive. Okay. I put here some incubators and accelerators in Indonesia, so probably this this is not a comprehensive list. Obviously, these are examples only uh, of the incubators and accelerators in Indonesia. Um, now, how 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 can you finance or how uh, startup founders can finance their startups? So first of all, uh, one key element of a startup success is the ability to obtain uh, enough funding to start and grow the business, obviously. So first we start with the startup founders uh, that they will be having, putting some of their money probably in the business. Second, uh, there are several uh, uh, parties that can provide financing to the startups, such as angel in financing. So angel investors uh, are typically individuals who invest in startup or early stage companies. Uh, obviously, they will receive ownership, stake, or interest in the company. Then we talk about crowdfunding. So these are the new way of uh, raising funds, specifically for the small startups. Uh, uh, small startups probably when they uh, they cannot go to the VC and ask for funding because it's costly, and VCs they will not accept them. So crowdfunding is another alternative to finance these small startups. Uh, uh, and these now there are several uh, famous uh, platforms for crowdfunding all over the world, either in Europe uh, or developed countries, or so also uh, we have it also in emerging or developing countries as well. Banking financing for startup is quite difficult, very difficult, because banks usually they ask for collateral guarantee, which ca uh, startups cannot provide that. So, but again, it's one way uh, that uh, startups can sometimes uh, go to uh, uh, and find out uh, some financing needs or finance their financing needs through banking system. VCs, uh, startups seeking financing often turn to venture capital firms, and these VCs they can provide capital, but also a lot of uh, a lot of assistance um, uh, and mentorship in uh, through their VC structures, and then uh, besides only providing the funds to these startups. Uh, financing uh, startups, so the key. Terms negotiated uh, in a venture capital is the valuation. Actually, this is the main the main uh, thing that should be discussed between the founder and any uh, of the fund providers. The valuation: how much is the value right now of the startup? Um, uh, what what would be the value per per share, for instance, as for uh, for time being? What would be the form of the investment? So typically, uh, either it's a convertible preferred stock or from the beginning it's a common stock. Um, what's the liquidation preference for the VC? What's the exit plan for the VC or for the private equity firm that will be investing in that uh, startup? So what's the exit plan? Uh, board of directors composition, would, uh, would the VC uh, 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 sit on the board and make or uh, decide on all the uh, 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 matters that are important to the, to the uh, startup or not? Uh, also some other things, right to participate in future financing. Do they have the right to participate in the next round of financing or not? And some other um, items that should be clarified and clearly stated uh, uh, while uh, asking for these financing. Different stages for of startup funding. So we talk about self-funding. For first of all, the founder can put some of, of his or her money in the in the startup, and then we move to the seed cap. The seed cap is investment made by. 
uh, at the preliminary stage of the startup. So this is the early stage financing. Then you talk about the venture that we already talked about. And ideally, any startup would lead to an IPO, initial public offerings, which where the startup would be sold on the financial market. And then um, the public uh, can, can benefit or can buy shares in that startup. OK, uh, in terms of venture capital, uh, as some of you might know, there are different series. We have series A, series B and series C. So uh, obviously series A are the early stage, the first the very first round of funding, then we move to Series B, which are a little bit more advanced. Series C actually, uh, so uh, will be uh, the uh, venture capital be intervening in a company that is already successful business. So in other words, the company is running, uh, is uh, is running, the company is selling its products and it becomes a literally successful business. But the Series C would help probably in terms of growing uh, the, uh, the, the, the startup uh, in the future. Now, fintech industry, if I move to the fintech, um, and this is probably the, the purpose of this presentation, specifically not only startup, but also fintech. So the, the, there is a report recently, book actually, uh, the global fintech market by technology, service, application, and by region, competition forecast and opportunity 2026. This book, and it's a, it's a comprehensive report uh, that uh, reports some facts about the fintech industry worldwide. So uh, this uh, report uh, has valued the fintech industry by 2020 around $7.3 trillion, and it's projected to grow at a cumulative annual growth rate of 26.87% per year over the 2020-2026 period, which is huge, by the way. You can see the progress is huge. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of innovations like mobile wallet, digitized money, paperless lending, specifically with the pandemic now, uh, so, etc. So, a lot of a lot of uh, innovation in the fintech are taking place and are still taking place worldwide. Um, now, uh, the 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 new trend now in fintech is application of AI on, in finance, uh, artificial intelligence. So, AI has become a critical element of the fintech industry in terms of collecting the data because you can deal with the huge data. Uh, uh, you can analyze a lot of data through so data analytics or financial data analytics. Now you have a lot of AI applications in terms of financial data analytics that can help uh, uh, that can help investors to make uh, like informed decisions when it comes to investing. That can help banks to collect information or uh, about their customers and so on and so forth. So a lot of things that could be used here uh, uh, to help the finance financial industry and also investors to make a better decisions. Uh, finally, now there is a lot of uh, now implementation of AI also in terms of advanced risk analytics and fraud detection. Uh, uh, now the AI use uh, uh, in this way is helpful to the financial institutions to detect fraud um, uh, uh, and also to, to apply like advanced risk uh, uh, framework. Uh, fintech industry, so where can we, or different segments in the fintech, first of all talk about the, the payment, second fund transfers, third, personal finance, fourth, loans, and fifth, now insurance, and also we have uh, equity and wealth management. Um, I will quickly move to the, also the fintech industry by region. We will go back and revisit these segments in detail, by the way. Uh, in terms of regions, so um, uh, the fintech market has been segmented into various regions, including Asia, Pacific, Europe, North America, and South America, and Middle East, and Africa. And then among these region, Asia Pacific region is, is going to exhibit the highest growth in the forecast period, which is 20, uh, 2020 till 2026. Not North America, not Europe, but Asia Pacific region would see the highest growth in the fintech industry over the next five years, probably. Uh, the most innovative fintech in 2021, I just took from uh, an article from Forbes, so they, they, they mentioned what, what are the uh, the most innovative fintech companies in 2021. You have the link, you can visit that. Uh, it has a lot of uh, great idea in terms of these new fintech, uh, and then these uh, uh, that are the, the best uh, innovative ideas in the fintech in 2021 year. Okay, now um, moving to the KPMG report in terms of the fintech, and then they, it, it, also, it only reports the, uh, the uh, uh, different or the deal values by the first half of 2021 only. So there is a lot of uh, uh, information you can detect or we can, we can get out of these uh, figures here. So the first one is total global investment activity. If you can see the first graph here, 
total uh, global investment activity, VC, PE, and merchant acquisition in fintech. Uh, just by the half of 2021, it has reached 20, 98 billion. Uh, just in 2020, it has reached 121. In other words, by the end of the year, we expect that this number will be much higher. Now, uh, global venture activity in fintech, so the VC, only here, as you can see, it has reached quite uh, uh, a quite uh, high number by 2021. Again, this is only half of 2021, not necessarily the whole year. Okay, same for the merger and acquisition, and also the same for the PE. Again, we only report half the half uh, half of the year 2021. Uh, you can see that overall, I mean, if we look at the total number here, 98 billion as compared to 121 for the whole year, it means that we expect that 2021 will be uh, uh, will be having a higher uh, amount, deal amount, as compared to 2020, obviously, in terms of the fintech. Uh, here, across the different quarters, I will skip that. Uh, I will not spend too much time on it. Now, uh, what are the top 10 global fintech, according to the KPMG report, again, in, in the first half of 2021? Uh, the, the number one is Refinitiv. As some of you might know, Refinitiv used to be called Thomson Reuters. Thomson Reuters, um, now it changed into Refinitiv, and actually the... Um, uh, London Stock Exchange has acquired Thomson Reuters, and then that it, now it's called Refinitiv. And this is, again, it's a huge amount. We talk about $14.8 billion uh, a deal that took place um, uh, in for Refinitiv here. And you have some others that will not spend time on it, okay? Now, overall, what are the different fintech segments? The different fintech segments, according to the Philadelphia Fed, um, uh, it, 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 we can split that down into either credits, or digital payments, savings, investment, and portfolio financial management. And finally, it's what we call the DLT, uh, distributed ledger technology, that um, that covers the uh, cryptocurrency, uh, crypto, uh, the, uh, the uh, crypto currencies in general, and then the blockchain technology uh, uh, overall that is used in finance, okay? Um, more uh, or better split of the fintech uh, uh, segments now. If we talk about the fintech segments, so we have, first of all, we talk about financing, financing either through crowdfunding or uh, uh, or uh, 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 or also here we have the uh, uh, reward based crowdfunding, uh, crowd investing, crowd lending. So uh, again, we we have the 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 uh, uh, the P2P, for instance, platforms uh, for lending. So in other words, now uh, some uh, people who need money, they do not they do not necessarily go to a bank to borrow that money. They can go to these platforms and borrow money from other investors, not necessarily banks. Uh, also, in terms of financing, we have credit and factoring now. Um, in terms of credit rating, for instance, um, uh, money laundering and so on. So this is the new innovations that are taking place in the fintech. Uh, then the second category which is asset management. As you can see here, we talk about social trading. Now, what's, what's social trading? Uh, usually now, uh, investors, they try to compare their investment strategies as compared to peers and experts. So this is these are platforms where investors they share their experience in investment. Where are they investing? And then it allow other investors to align their investment strategy to these experts. For instance, uh, robo advice. Now I can tell you that in in the UAE, for instance, now robo advice taking a huge place now. So you no know, no longer you no longer have uh, uh, financial advisors who will be calling you. So you can call a number and then you can make uh, you can choose whatever you want amongst a whole list of choices and then uh, by the end of the day you can get your advice so in other words you can call at any time you don't need to call during business hours you can you can call at any time any day of the week any day of the year and you still get your uh, uh, your financial advice uh, then we have also under asset management personal financial management uh, here pfm and then investment and banking uh, finally payments in terms of payment alternative payment methods how can you uh, digital payment, for instance, this is one of the examples here. Uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency, uh, and and then uh, towards the end, other fintech insurance. Now, insurance companies they are attracting a lot of fintech investments, and then a lot of fintech ideas are towards are targeted towards the insurance companies. I will discuss it in few seconds from now, by the way. Okay. Um, now. According to the KPMG in its 2021 report, so um, we have the, the following fintech segments. They call it payments, insurtech, so these are uh, fintech that are targeted to insurance companies, regtech, so these are fintech that are dealing with regulatory issues, wealthtech, so these are fintech that uh, uh, are uh, allowing the 
uh, wealth management, and then finally blockchain, cryptocurrency, and cyber uh, securities uh, fintech. These are the numbers, the deals, uh, and the deal value, num number of deals and the deal value that took place um, up to the first half of 2021. Uh, you can see that uh, you can see that the, the number of deals, by the way, here the payments, in terms of payments, uh, you can see that uh, in 2021, we still have quite interesting uh, amount here as compared to 2020. The spike took place in 2019, by the way, uh, around $113 billion that took place in 2019. Now, um, uh, the other one is InsureTech. InsureTech, again, it's growing uh, as well. Uh, I mean, in this year, we so far in half, I mean, in the first half, there were 7.1 billion as compared to 16.5 billion for the whole year in 2020. But the RecTech, RecTech has a huge increase in 2020, as you can see here, due to the COVID, because several regulatory authorities, they tried to make the uh, regulatory requirements like online and so on. So huge investment went to the rec tech in 2020, but still it's a growing uh, as well. So uh, you can see in, in the first half of 2021, it has attracted 6.6 .6 billion as compared to 10.4 for the whole 2020. So expect that actually by the end of the year 2021, this number probably will exceed the what, what took place in 2020. Uh, cybersecurity, again, with a, with a lot of with a huge shift to the online platforms, online banking, so we expect a lot of uh, uh, operational risk uh, 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 rising from these uh, shift or from this shift to the online banking specifically. Then obviously there is a huge investment in cyber security now, as you can see in 2021. Only by the half by uh, by the first six months of 2021, uh, we reached 3.7 million billion, sorry, which is by far more than what 2020 total deals uh, uh, were before. Uh, again, wealth tech, again, uh, this includes robo advising and so on. So it has increased a lot uh, uh, as compared to 2020. Again, you can see the graph here, uh, cryptocurrency. This is the uh, new trend, by the way, now in uh, cryptocurrency, crypto world in general. China is trying to dominate that, by the way, by coming up with its own uh, central bank digital currency trying to take the lead in that way because other central banks probably are still waiting uh, uh, before moving towards or deciding what to do exactly uh, with these cryptocurrencies. Now, uh, what I put here quickly, uh, startup uh, framework or legal framework in Tunisia. So in Tunisia, there were like what we call the Startup Act that was launched in uh, April 2019. Uh, the aim of this act is to make Tunisia or to make the uh, startup ecosystem friendly in Tunisia to help uh, startup companies to uh, to to start their business to uh, to operate and then to have uh, the legal framework to help them uh, being different from any typical company. Okay, the Startup Act has uh, three different uh, pillars. Uh, startup Act per se that uh, 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 that tries to come up with a new legal framework uh, to promote startups that are launched in Tunisia. Then Startup Invest, which is a new investment framework to bring out an industry uh, of solid and dynamic VCs. And then Startup Empower, so a new startup scheme for startups and ecosystem support structures, such as the fund that is, uh, that is available now in Tunisia. Uh, startup State, so any startup that is uh, trying to innovate in the public uh, uh, administration, in the public sector specifically, so will be uh, uh, also helped in that way. There are some categories, so I will, I will skip it now. Um, uh, there is a report recently by um, by a company which is called Smart Cap that shows uh, uh, or that shows the highlights of startup in Tunisia, startup industry in Tunisia. So so far since 2019, the launch of the Startup Act, there were 4.416 applications. So 248 got the uh, label of startup. So in Tunisia, which is quite good number. Uh, success rate of 70% almost. Um, uh, I will probably, because the time is uh, running a little bit uh, fast here, so I will uh, quickly go through the slides and I will go to the last one, which is uh, challenges and opportunities for Tunisian startups, uh, specifically, I mean, startups, but it could be uh, also applicable to fintech. Uh, just which regions are attracting most of the startups in Tunisia? 75.4% in Grand, uh, Grand Tunis, Tunis capital. Uh, a little bit more in the north, some 10.5 in the Mideast, 
uh, and then the others are scattered all over the country. Now, which indices are attracting most of the uh, startup ideas? First, business software and services marketplace, ed tech, education tech, and then you can imagine that for sure with this, with the this pandemic, so a lot of shift from uh, a manual work to uh, online platforms for education institutions. And then fintech actually is, a, is, is attracting 9.7% of all these startup uh, 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 in Tunisia, which is quite interesting number, by the way. Age distribution, you can see uh, the, 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 the good thing that uh, uh, the startup were started by people who are between 20 to 34 years old, so 52% of it, 70, 77% are male, 23% are female, and then uh, uh, 35 to 49 years old, they are uh, 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 they are uh, they are responsible for having like 43.4 percent of total startups in Tunisia, with a breakdown between male and female. Obviously, you can see it here. Finally, most of the uh, startupers or startup founders they have a baccalaureate plus five years. So in other words, kind of master's degree, uh, and they start their uh, they have their startup uh, in Tunisia. Now, uh, I will quickly uh, move to the uh, startup in Tunisia. This is an example of startups. FinTech in Tunisia. Now, Central Banker is doing a lot of efforts in terms of uh, uh, in terms of coming up with a friendly framework for for FinTech. Specifically, they, they actually have the BCT FinTech Lab that is uh, 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 that or whose aim is to foster financial inclusion, support financial stability, and, and help actually FinTech to uh, be successful. Now, uh, here what I put at the last slide, so challenges and opportunities to fintech in Tunisia. So first of all, um, let's start with the opportunities here. Great talents in all disciplines in Tunisia. Uh, one of the highest rate of engineers, tech talents per uh, 1,000 capita. So Tunisia, according to the UNESCO, Tunisia beats US and Germany with the highest percentage of STEM graduates, which is, which is great, by the way. Uh, now, uh, a lot of uh, changes in rules and regulations, such as Startup Act, crowdfunding framework, it came uh, recently and then we need more uh, 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 precisions, more information about the framework. Now, what are the challenges? Some challenges that are still in Tunisia uh, that are uh, making the fintech industry or growth very slow. First of all, the central bank FX law that uh, is outdated. It dated since the 60s, but it has never changed. Uh, payments constraints, how to make these fintech startup global if they, they are still facing these payments constraints. Even though the Startup Act came up with a lot of improvements in terms of that, but still there are some constraints when it comes to central bank. Uh, alignment between Startup Act and BCT, that's what I was mentioning here. So they have to come up with, uh, I mean, alignment in terms of regulations, because as soon as Startup Act was out, central bank uh, came in and then said, OK, uh, there are still some constraints when it comes to dealing with foreign currencies, paying, making payments in foreign currencies, receiving payments in foreign currencies, and so on. Time and cost of payment transactions still quite long in Tunisia. Uh, in Tunisian financial market is still small, and there is like uh, now work to uh, examine how can we move from a uh, uh, developing market to a frontier market, okay, uh, uh, from from a stock exchange perspective. Uh, which is not easy because the market cap is still very low in Tunisia. Only uh, only few companies, do not say only one company, can meet the criteria to move into a frontier market, uh, which has a uh, uh, an accepted or which has a quite uh, a high market cap. The others are very small market cap, so they don't meet the uh, requirements to uh, be uh, considered as a frontier market. Uh, revamp the business and engineering curriculum, probably towards more entrepreneurship. So put more emphasis on the entrepreneurship in these schools to make sure that the students, when they graduate, they can, they can, they have, uh, or they more, they are more inclined to start their uh, their business as compared to uh, uh, to before. Low level of financial inclusion. So very, a uh, lot of people they do not have access to the financial services, specifically the ones that are in remote areas. Internet speeds and quality. Tunisia is still suffering from bad uh, quality of the internet and low internet speed. Uh, lobbying against digitalization, change of power, because this is what Nizar Aish was mentioning before, by the way, at the beginning of this uh, this workshop. And then there are a lot of uh, uh, participants who are against the change because if there is, if the change takes place, 
the power or bargaining power would be changing. And then there are some still people who are trying to stick to the old fashioned uh, uh, way of doing things. Financial inclusion, uh, e know your customer, for instance, then it, you can allow your customers to open account uh, remotely. They don't need to be physically there, specifically the ones who are living in remote areas uh, and then allow more uh, digital payments. So uh, this is what I, I try to uh, present here in terms of challenges. So open to any question that you might have, please. I mean, dear colleagues, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. Uh, I will try to answer as the best that I can in terms of uh, a Tunisian framework. So I'm not uh, uh, too much into that, but I know what, what are the, the practices elsewhere. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Uh, Dr. Samet for this amazing presentation. Uh, so we're gonna make it quick. We will start with Wasim's question. So um, he's asking, many of these uh, checklist points don't really apply in Tunisia, where funding is insanely hard to come by. Lack of investor, trust, governmental regulations, very few success stories. What can we do to surpass that in our country? Okay. Uh, was even just to tell you one thing. I mean, uh, if, if the idea is is, is good enough, uh, I I have seen uh, several startups that are financed not necessarily by uh, VCs in Tunisia, but they can target other fund uh, providers elsewhere. Uh, let's say the Lab Six, for instance, uh, just an example that I know. I'm I'm not I'm just mentioning the name because I know the the example. I'm not advertising any of these uh, fund providers, but I mean uh, they have presence in Tunisia. Uh, Lebanon, uh, UAE, so they can, yeah, they can provide financing. So in other words, if you have a great idea, if you can speak, if you can, uh, 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 if you can sell your idea, then there are investors who are there. Now, not only that, I mean, I was, I, I, I dealt with few things, specifically the Biat Lab, people who are, who are involved in Biat Lab. Uh, uh, I know that they are financing several projects. There are projects that are done by people who have PhDs. And then now um, they are financing these great ideas. So still, um, financing is all all is is difficult all over the world. Not only not only in Tunisia, but still, if you have the good idea, it makes the life of the uh, uh, entrepreneur or the startup founder much easier. But again, we all know that it's worldwide. It's not only Tunisia Tunisia problem only. So, uh, but again, if the idea is great, you can easily sell it. And you can find people who will be willing to finance that idea. Thank you. Uh, next question from Ines. How much do accelerators charge for startups in Tunisia in terms of fees and equity share? OK, uh, usually uh, Ines, uh, good question. Usually these accelerators, uh, they have like VCs and they have fund uh, providers behind. So actually, if you look at the accelerator, it's a structure that is there, but usually uh, the structure is financed by these uh, angel investors or VCs. I mean, usually the aim of these accelerators, and then I can tell you, I mean, in my experience uh, uh, in, uh, in, in several of Paul Technologic, so I, I was involved somehow there. So they don't charge money, but the aim is to, uh, to pick the best ideas and to finance them later on. So you have the VCs and the, um, the angel investors who are literally financing, I mean, like Biat Lab, for instance, uh, who are financing uh, these accelerators to make sure they pick the best out of them. Thank you. Uh, Sami's question was, what business challenges does FinTech face in offering the new service? Say it again. Uh, let me look at the question. Yes. What is Sami's question? Say, can, you, can you repeat again, please? It was what business challenges does fintech face face in offering the new service? Oh yeah, I mean first of all the uh, I mean as uh, as I mentioned, so fintech. If you need to, um, if you need, if you come up with a great idea in fintech, what you need, you need decent internet connection. We all are aware that in Tunisia there are several problems with the internet. Now, these are online services, right? So you need uh, uh, internet with high speed. That, uh, 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 that has no problem at all, first. Second, now, if you would like to make your fintech global, so you definitely need to uh, have easy payments in different currencies, not necessarily in Tunisian dinar, because if you like to offer your service abroad specifically, so you, have, you, should, you, you should no longer have these 
constraints in terms of payment, in terms of FX rules that are outdated. I mean, we all are aware of it. So they, the central bank should actually come up with innovation uh, in terms of these rules, make the life of the fintech. I mean, I, 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 I was part of a meeting in January, I think, where there are some fintech uh, entrepreneurs involved. And then um, one of them, he came up with very good idea, but he was mentioning literally these problems. How can you make these payments easier, either in inward or outward, both? So, I mean, now in, we are in a world which is, uh, which is as was what Ines was mentioning today. So with globalization, so you cannot like put too many constraints, put too many barriers for these think tank and ask them, no, you have to come up with ideas, you have to grow. So a lot of constraints, barriers should be removed, actually. Yes. And then, that's what I was talking about, alignment with the Startup Act, because Startup Act, when we saw it at the beginning, it was great, specifically when it comes to the payment. Right after few, I think one day after, Central Bank came, came back and said, no, there are some constraints again. So this is what probably the regulators, they have to think about. And so they put in the last slide, by the way, last point, I was mentioning that. So regulators cannot just lag behind. Regulators you have to learn, engage, and regulate. So they have to understand what are the challenges, what are the issues. They have to uh, uh, hear from the ecosystem. What are your problems? How can you make the uh, uh, the framework more friendly? How can we help you? I mean, this is this this is the, the the easiest way to help these startup to grow and to see the light. Because if you, as a startup founder, you think that there are a lot of barriers, a lot of problems, a lot of issues. This will not help you in terms of starting any business. You know that you have a lot of a lot of barriers in front of you. So why would you do it? Yes. Yep. I uh, I have a question. It's not. Yep. It's it's more of a um, an opinion. But um, what do you think we can do from our side? Because here we're talking about fintech technology, uh, being open to the world. Um, creating solution that will help international investment banks to manage their financial activities. We're talking like, we know we have the human potential. And for me, it's the the, the number one factor that will help you succeed your, your, your fintech startup. Like we have this, but at the same time, we have a lot of uh, things that will block this activity to grow up. Like we keep talking about this, we have everything. At the same time, we cannot uh, make any progress. We cannot um, be internationally um, successful because our government is not open enough, is not helping us enough, is not pushing us, helping us, giving us, giving us the possibility to 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 work internationally. Like we have the payments uh, problem. Um, we have the, the currency uh, issue. We have a lot of things. What do you think we can do from our side, like as a, a small uh, association that's that's uh, trying to grow up to help um, avoid all of these uh, things that are blocking us from, from shining? I think that there are different, several uh, uh, actions you can take. Um, I mean, I mean, first of all, probably before talking about regulation, uh, if you go back to the curriculum of all business schools in Indonesia, and let's let's check uh, if any of them is offering a fintech course. Now, this first of all, I mean, if none of them, I mean, uh, to the best of my knowledge, at least the way that I know that, I don't, I did not, I don't know any of them who is offering a fintech course. Now, if none of them is offering a fintech course. How can you expect from these new generation, the doers, the future doers, to start a business in an industry that they have no idea about? What's the fintech? What are the challenges? What can I do? What's missing? What's the problems? Can I solve these problems? Not only business schools, by the way. Go to engineering schools, so the same thing. Now, what we can do also, we can come up with recommendations. What things can, small things probably, small actions can be taken to improve the regulatory framework to help to help removing some of the barriers that will make investors investing or coming up with ideas and without a lot of barriers. And I think that this is what the central bank now, they are very active in terms of that. They, I think that they have one person, uh, I forgot his, her name, uh, uh, I think that uh, Ms. Grimazi is something like that. She's very good 
and they, she came up with the what they call sandbox uh, in Central Bank, and they come up with receiving ideas from entrepreneurs, and they sit and they listen. The first thing is you have to listen to understand what 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 are the challenges for these entrepreneurs to start an idea to make it successful. So they have to listen, then understand, and then come up with regulations. So they have to have these sessions to be aware of what the ecosystem needs are too often. And then they have to act accordingly. 